He leads one of the largest online retailers in the country. They are prolific users of social media and employ market techniques that defy tradition. The cutting edge company makes pizza. G. Patrick Doyle, president and CEO of Domino's Pizza, is this week's leader on leadership. Knowing when to ask for help is critical when you're in a leadership position. It's getting the best out of people. It's the essence of leadership. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. Welcome to Leaders on Leadership, here with a student audience on campus at the Wayne State University and Detroit Public Television, Midtown Detroit Studio. I'm Larry Phelps. Patrick Doyle did his university work at U of M in, in economics and his MBA in Chicago, but it took a while to find his life's work. Thanks for being here, Patrick. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate the invitation. I look for a trend line in your early career moves, uh, doing banking in Chicago, medical devices in France, and Gerber baby food right. in North America. <laughs> Was there a career plan going on no. there? Or just looking? Clearly not. <laughs> you just clearly not looking no. at what you want to be when you grow up. I was, you know, I was just finding great opportunities, and I came out of U of M. I had this terrific opportunity to, to go work for a bank in in Chicago, and they were actually paying for my MBA at night, uh, which was the only way I could afford to get it, and uh, and so it was just a fabulous opportunity. It was First National Bank of Chicago, which is since merged about 12 times now into it's part of JP Morgan now but uh, fabulous experience gave me you know my financial background and training and acumen and and you know and then I realized I, I was kind of more interested in the in the businesses that we were financing uh, than doing the financing itself and so I moved into one of them. Uh, you did the uh, medical devices and, and with the French company, uh, yep. intervascular, and, yep. and then to Gerber Baby Food. Exactly. Worked in Canada, U.S. Yep. I looked, at first I couldn't see any business relationship between Gerber Baby Food and Domino's Pizza when you moved there as, right. as vice president, senior vice president of marketing. But then I realized that babies don't buy their food, their parents do. And their parents And do, their parents right? buy pizza. <laughs> Plus my girls were getting older, so you know the free samples on the baby food weren't a big, <laughs> weren't a big thing anymore. I had to move on to something better, so that's right. <laughs> were, there, were there some experiences from Gerber that helped you when you moved into marketing at Domino's? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the consumers and, and understanding consumers and kind of the analytics that you bring to that and, and, and understanding how to persuade them and how to listen to them. And, uh, you know, those things are very, very similar at, at really any consumer product company. So it's not really necessary for the leader of an organization to be the best whatever that organization does. It's how you connect the dots and the questions yeah, you ask. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly helpful. I mean, you, you know, and you want to have done different things, and I've done that at, you know, at Domino's. I've, I've covered different areas in Domino's. But, uh, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, you're not going to be expert at everything that, you know, you're in charge of at some point in your career as you keep moving along. And uh, so it becomes about setting vision and finding great people that you empower to get things done. As you're moving up that ladder at, uh, at Domino's, um, one of the jobs you had with the interesting title, Executive Vice President Building Brand, Building right, the Brand. Building the Brand, right. <laughs> it's also known as a marketing Marketing, department. yeah, exactly. Marketing is a function that the department does, but Build the, pra build the Brand is the that's desired the goal. end that's result. The exa that's exactly right. How does the semantics for the name change the leadership perspective? Yeah, it, you know, it was, it was something that, that we did that we wanted to make sure that everybody understood, you know, kind of what the end objective was. So as opposed to you know, just simply a function. We do marketing. It's look. It's about building the brand, and you know, and uh, our our human resources group is called People First, and uh, and so those sorts of things. Yeah. Events to 2007. You became president of the company. Right. 
in the, in the, that was near the end where Tom Monahan, the founder, was still actively leading the company? No, he actually sold out in 1998. Oh, he sold it. He sold in 1998. Okay. Bain Capital bought us then. Dave Brandon came in as CEO. Okay. And, uh, and, and so I became president and then eventually followed Dave. When Dave was on the show, he told us the story about his first day at the company as the new chair CEO, and, he's, and, he, and he, he gave a speech, as I remember, he told us, if you like change, you're going to love me. Yep. If you want to celebrate the good old days, I'm going to drive you nuts. Yep. How'd you react to that speech? He wasn't a pizza guy. Right. <laughs> How'd you react you know to what? that? We, we needed a lot of change. I mean, Tom had great ideas. Uh, you know, our founder, Tom Monahan, had great ideas about the business, had had built up something you know that was that was terrific around some some pretty simple ideas that that we stuck to but you know Dave came in he was really the first outside professional manager um, terrific people leader and uh, we needed a lot of change and uh, and so it was a lot we did in putting in process and 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 finding great people and all of those sorts of things that the end of the day, it, he was going to drive a lot of change, and people had to. He was setting an expectation from the beginning that, uh, you know, there is going to be change. Either embrace that and accept that, and think that that's going to be, you know, a terrific opportunity, or maybe it's time to go. Now, one of the changes that you and Dave worked on together was to change a little thing called the pizza right. <laughs> at Domino's Pizza. That's a big thing. It's a big part of the yeah. business. Yeah. <laughs> when you're talking. When you're talking about changing the core product, I mean, right. other companies have tried that, Pepsi, for example, and it didn't work so well. Right. What kind of things go through your mind? What do you consider as you're making that decision? Yeah, you know, it really, I mean, Marketing 101 says know who you are, know what your point of differentiation is. And for Domino's, for the first 48, 49 years of the company, it was about the delivery. Right? We were the 30-minute guys. We were the people that if you wanted food fast, we'd get it to you quickly, and it was all around that service. And we'd done that for a long time, built a, a terrific company around that, but there was a point at which we realized that you know, for us to continue to progress, we had to have a pizza that people loved as well. And uh, you, know, you, you look at it now and you say, really, it took you 48, 49 years to, to figure out that a great pizza would, would help. But you know, we were following kind of the basic concept, which is focus on what you're known for, and that was always about reinforcing the convenience and the speed of delivery. And so we did that, and you know, and we took our time to make sure we got it right on the on the pizza. As you're going through that process to reinvent the core product, yeah. do you, as a CEO, hold small secret meetings to to, to figure out where, where you're going to go, what the, how the pizza is going to be, so you keep it confidential both inside the company and to the competition? Or do you go for the wider inputs from, uh, from the larger community and start building consensus? Yeah, well, internally there, were, there was an originally a reasonably small group of people who were working on it in our R&D group, in our marketing group, and some of our franchisees, the people who own and operate our stores, who were involved with it, who were kind of buying into the idea of, of where we wanted to go. Uh, but then building that consensus, once we knew we had something, became a critical part of the rollout. But doesn't taking time to build consensus add a lot of time to the process? Yeah. Wouldn't it be more efficient just to do an email and say, you know, Here's yeah, what's happening? Yeah, we, had, we, we absolutely had to take our time doing that. We moved very quickly through that, but we had to make sure that we got that right because you know, we were asking 1,100 U.S. franchisees who make their living from Domino's Pizza, who pay their mortgage, are putting their kids through college, uh, you know, off of their earnings from the from this pizza, and it was more expensive, the new pizza that we launched. So we were asking them um, to have faith in the changes that we were making, and we needed to get them on board. So you know, we met. We had five meetings over the course of of a week. The city a week went around and presented it to all of our franchisees and ultimately getting their buy-in was critical to the success. I still give them a lot of credit because frankly there was still a leap of faith and I think you know credit on that accrues to them because they made the leap of faith but also to the team overall who had built enough trust and credibility over the years that they were willing to, to make that leap of faith with us. So it was easier to build a consensus because you had 20 years of cooperation absolutely. and trust to build on? Right, absolutely. What would have happened yeah, if that, it wouldn't have been that way? Uh, you, you know, then we probably wouldn't have gotten it done. and wouldn't have felt like we would have been empowered to even try in the first place. 
and uh, and so having those relationships was critical. But you know, we did this in a tough time. I mean, you know, this was the end of 2009 when we were doing that. We launched at the beginning, really the last week of 09, right at the beginning of, of 2010. And a lot of these franchisees were coming out of, you know, that very tough period in the economy. So getting them to do that at, at that you know, point in time and them giving us permission to do that was very important to the success. Why didn't you wait until times were better to roll out a risky move? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we needed to do it. We needed to, the, you know, the, and never waste a good crisis, right? And, you know, we were coming out of, of a rough period of time, and, you know, and that's a great time to drive change. I mean, it actually becomes harder to drive change when the economy is good and everybody's business is doing well, then that sense of urgency is gone. People say, well, why do I need to change? Things are good. I'm making money. The business is growing. Uh, and it actually becomes more difficult to, to make change than if you're in a period that's tough and everybody accepts that thing, you know, things aren't good. We got to do something. Now, you had another little challenge when you were rolling out to be the new pizza. About that time, um, your uh, predecessor, the chairman and CEO, got a call from University of Michigan and asked if he'd like to be right. athletic director. Right. <laughs> and he walked out the door just staying as non-executive chairman. Right. How does that feel to be the new president CEO taking this on <laughs> the as, same as, time a, we were as a solo? Without yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the answer is, uh, you know, Dave and I were working on this together along with, you know, the whole team and Russell Wiener, our our CMO and, and Lynn, our, our, our communications person. I mean, everybody was, was, was working on this together. And so, it, you know, this was something that we all bought into, that our whole leadership team bought into, that we needed to make this change. And, uh, you know, and Dave wasn't going far. He was, you know, he was only a couple miles down the road. And, uh, and so it was, you know, it was absolutely fine. I mean, I, when I look back on it, I give him more credit uh, that, you know, because he would have known this was going on, you know, that maybe he was going to be making this change longer than I did. And for him to finish his time uh, at Domino's going out with that big a change, you know, that, that wasn't necessarily the easy decision. He could have just gone out. He had a great time there. And he could have just gone out and said, let's go steady as she goes. And, you know, I'll let Patrick deal with it when, uh, you know, when, when he's in the seat. Leaders usually like a plan B. Right. When you introduced the new pizza, right. you essentially trashed the old pizza. Right. Was there a plan B? There was no plan B. There was absolutely not a plan B. Plan, plan B was uh, the board finds a new CEO and he figures out how to fix it. <laughs> um, there really wasn't. But you know what? Um, uh, you know, we, we've said around the company before, I mean, we burned the bridge. Right? I mean, an old military deal, right? If you want to make sure people are focused and moving forward, burn the bridge behind them, and so they know they can't go backwards. We burned the bridge. You know, we went out to bring attention to this. Uh, we went out and we said, yep, we hear you. That old pizza wasn't what it should have been, and we're making this change. But there was clearly no way we could go backward after we'd gone out and publicly said that the old one wasn't as good as it should have been. You've said a couple of times that one of the things that helped in this whole change is that you as a company absolutely knew the pizza was the problem. Yeah. I'm assuming that people who lead most companies, most good companies, know what their real problems are yeah. late at night when there's no crowd around. Yeah. Why do they, other companies have trouble <laughs> facing that one big problem, fixing it, and moving on? Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extraordinarily good question because I, I absolutely... Uh, agree with your point. I mean, I think most companies um, are sitting there, they know what the core problem is, and they avoid it because they just think the, the risk in taking that big hill is too high, and, uh, and they choose to work on the other things. We knew what our big hill was. We, you know, we had kind of worked around it as well, we, but we were following kind of classic marketing learning, which is focus on that differentiation, which is service, but we always knew that the consumer perception of the pizza wasn't what we wanted it to be. And uh, so I don't know. I, you know, I think the, the real answer is great leaders take that big hill. They know where it is. Everybody in the company knows, you know, what that one big issue is that they really ought to get around to solving. And great leaders take that hill. They go after it. Thanks for being here, Patrick. Absolutely. 
We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll talk more with Patrick Doyle about leadership at Domino's Pizza. Welcome back to Leaders on Leadership. Joining us today is Patrick Doyle, President and CEO of Domino's Pizza, and we're talking about leading a corporation in today's social media world. In early 2009, there was a video that went out yep. on the social services showing some uh, Domino's employees making pizza with really... Doing something foul. Yeah, really, yeah. really inappropriate <laughs> process. What was your reaction? And that thing went viral. What was your reaction when you first heard about it? Yeah, I was uh, I was actually on vacation, <laughs> so I was uh, I was down in Florida with my wife's family, and uh, and I got a phone call from uh, from Tim McIntyre, uh, who's our VP of Communications, and he said, you know, this thing is out there, and usually these things go away. This looks like it's starting to catch fire, and uh, I think we're going to have to deal with this one. So yeah, my, you know, you get a knot in your stomach when that happens. So what was the thought process as, as President CEO and the other leaders in the company as you're deciding whether to respond or not, and if you do, how? Yeah, I, you know, I, first of all, I mean, our, our team is fabulous, and you know, and I got terrific advice, you know, through the process from you know from Tim and, and the whole team, and you know, and the answer was we could see it starting to build. I got an airplane and flew home. And, uh, and what we realized was that in the social media world, you know, the first reaction in kind of crisis communication is put out a press release or, you know, do something along those lines. And, you know, our view was this came out of social media. It came off of YouTube. You respond where the problem started. You got, you got to go back to the source of it and deal with it there because that's how it's kind of emanating out. So eventually it was on television, eventually being about 36 hours later, it was on all the national networks, but we'd already filmed a response that we put up on YouTube. It was getting hundreds of thousands of hits, you know, explaining how we were dealing with this, apologizing for it, and, uh, and, you know, and asking for our customers to continue to trust us. And it worked. And it worked, yeah. You also use social media uh, when you introduce the new pizza yep. and ask people to send pictures of the new pizza and, and give their comments how they liked it. Some people sent in pictures of pizzas that there may have been a mistake, it didn't, the right. box got dropped or whatever. Right. You started using the bad pizza photographs and text in commercials, websites, <laughs> Times Square billboards. Right. You gave every marketing professor on the planet a coronary hey. by breaking rule one <laughs> to show your bad, to show the bad stuff. Why, yeah. What made you do that? Yeah, you know, the, the world has changed, advertising has changed, marketing has changed dramatically. And so you go back 20, 30 years and a company like Domino's could control the message, right? So we could go out and buy hundreds of millions of dollars of television and just pound it at consumers and frankly, they had no way to respond. So they just had to sit and listen to what we told them uh, about Domino's Pizza. Well, that is now flipped around completely. And great companies are figuring this out quickly that consumers control the brand. You know, their perception of the brand is more important than what the company thinks the brand should be. And the way you manage that is you listen to people. You become a part of that conversation. You understand what's going right and wrong. You make changes, you know, based on that feedback that you're getting, and you're building trust by doing that. In our case, we've then taken that social media, and our mass media is following behind uh, the, the social media. Most people are still mass media driven, and then I need a social media strategy that fits in with that. We're doing it the opposite way. We're listening, and if you look at our, at our television, you know, our television is, is reflecting what's going on in social media. So somebody says, you messed up this pizza. You know, we film a commercial and show a bad pizza and say, we're incredibly sorry about this. We're going to fix it. And, uh, and so we're just echoing what's happening in, in social media. 
When you make that commitment that we're going to fix it, yeah. does that put more pressure on you to make sure that the changes and improvements happen? So it does, and and everybody through the system, they know that we do these things. They know that we follow through. They know that we're listening, and they know that when we make mistakes, we're gonna we're gonna you know we're gonna make a change and we're gonna fix it. And frankly, it's it's incredibly energizing to the system because they know we're gonna do the right thing. And, uh, and so it's actually, it's been, it's been terrific to, to be a part of this. This whole edgy approach to commercials and social media, pizza's a fun food, it's relatively inexpensive right. as, as prepared food goes. What, would the same type of approach work if you were, if for companies who sell very expensive, very high-end, very traditional goods? Yeah, I think it absolutely still does. You know, it's gonna be a little different, the communication that you're having, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you've got to react to that consumer and be led by the consumer because they can tell now on Facebook or through Twitter, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people about their, you know, their experience with your brand and they are trusted more by the, the people they know than the company is trusted you know, talking to them. And so they've now got a, you know, a megaphone, right? I mean, you know, they, they buy print or they buy ink by the barrel now, right? Because they can go on to these social sites and they can talk to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and their message is gonna be more trusted than what I'm saying in television. Is this whole conversation, you, you, said, you made the comment that uh, consumers are now in charge of the brand. Is that really a new thing? I mean, in 18th century, France, they knew who the good bakery was in town right. and talked about who was the bad one, right? Yeah, what's changed is, uh, you know, in, in you know, the old cliche was if somebody has a bad experience, they tell 10 people about it, right? And, you know, and what's changed is their ability to transmit that. So, you know, now they can tell 10,000 people or 100,000 people. So there's much more power from that one experience. So in the old days, the, they knew what the great bakery was in Paris. Um, you know, terrific. If they had a bad experience, they'd tell 10 people. If they had a good experience, they'd tell 10 people. Now it's just been magnified. And, uh, and so what might have taken a while, people having bad experiences with that bakery might have taken years. Now it could take a week or two weeks. Uh, and, you know, and it's gone everywhere. And, and you've got to react to it quickly. So the new pizza's out there. Right. The ads are working. Um, Everybody's starting to breathe normally again. Right. <laughs> Maybe walking with a little swagger, look at what we did, right? Right. As a leader of the company, how do you find a balance now so that people keep the confidence to, to keep making further improvements, yeah. don't go change for change's sake, and don't go complacent because of success? Yeah, you know, I, I, every time I'm talking to, to our franchisees, to, uh, you know, to the team in Ann Arbor, you know, I'm, I, I'm constantly reminding them that we cannot forget what 2008 and 2009 felt like. We can't let that out of our minds. We've got to keep that same sense of urgency about what, you know, doing what's right for the consumer. And so, you know, in some respects, it may be harder to keep that same intensity level going. But if you're focused on the consumer and people are feeling good about the changes that we're making, and they do, and I mean, you know, our franchisees and our team members, they're proud of what we're accomplishing. I think we can keep that momentum up. I've got one last question, Patrick. Uh, you've used social media, the companies use social media famously and with great success. Yep. Facebook's going IPO here. Right. Let's assume tomorrow, just hypothetically, you wake up and you're now CEO at Facebook. Right. The chairman Zuckerberg tells you, your assignment <laughs> is to figure out how to change Facebook so businesses want to use it more. How are you going to lead that product change? Yeah, well, I mean, we've got 5,000, you know, people who like us on Facebook now. And, uh, and so we're already using it. 5,000, 5 million. We're passing 5 million people today or tomorrow uh, on Facebook at Domino's. So we're already actively using it. And, uh, and, and effectively with, uh, with, with display ads and banner ads on there as well. We're using it for promotions. So from a, you know, from a change standpoint, what they're doing I think is great. It's really about companies figuring out how do they have that two-way dialogue with their, with their customers and do that effectively. You do that, you, you know, it's gonna be great.
their business. I think they've got it pretty well figured out, particularly for a guy who's 27 years old or whatever it is. Thanks for being here, Patrick. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Please join us again next time for another edition of Leaders on Leadership. See you then. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. An encore presentation of Leaders on Leadership is available online for viewing at dptv.org.